Hi folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivers, I'm the Carb Addiction Doc. And um, today I, I'm going to relate something that happened with me over the last week or two, a little epiphany. Um, something I've known about again, but it just came to the fore again. I am a board member of the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners. For those of you in the healthcare space, definitely be on that. But as such, um, I was asked to review and edit a document, um, a position statement on diabetes and diabetes management, particularly type 1 diabetes. And um, as I was editing the document, I realized that I, I kind of had an epiphany about where the problem lies. And as I talked to my, especially my type 1 diabetics that have had diabetes for 40 years, for 50 years, for 60 years, that go back to the 1970s in terms of their diabetes. And that's where you have to go back is to the history of this, because really the history changed in, in the late 70s, early 80s. But here's what happened. In the 70s and 80s, type 1 diabetes was a devastating disease because we didn't know how to manage it and we didn't have adequate monitoring and drugs. So in the 1970s and 80s, and if you talk to old uh, people that have had diabetes for a long time, those that you do will resonate, the best we had was to measure our urine to see how much, what our blood sugar was. Very inaccurate. We had these funny little, you prick, take a prick uh, of your uh, uh, prick of finger prick blood drop, you put it on a slide and you calculate what your blood sugar is by some slide technique on a slide, you'd wash that. I remember as a medical student, we used to have to check that as medical students on our patients. And it was a ludicrously inaccurate way of treating diabetes. And on top of that, we then had these newfangled drugs called insulin that in those days were extracted from the pancreas of cows and pigs. It's called bovine or porcine insulin. A lot of antibodies, a lot of reactions to it, but we had access to very rudimentary types of insulin. We didn't know how to make uh, insulin from bacteria yet. We didn't know how to generate um, insulin in a laboratory. So we used extracts from dead animals. And that was the best we had. So we had a terrible way of measuring blood sugar and we had very, very variable, basically two different types of insulins. So we didn't manage it very well. And the danger was um, going low. The thing that killed folks, at least to our understanding at the time, suddenly was a hypoglycemic event. So the fear was hypoglycemia. And we really didn't care how high people went on their blood sugars. And prior to the 1970s, we managed type, type 1 diabetics with a high-fat diet, a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. But in 1981, a guy that sat on my PhD committee, David Jenkins, Dr. David Jenkins, a vegetarian from Toronto in Canada, very well respected, wrote the sentinel paper called the glycemic index paper. And what the glycemic index paper did is for the first time, allow diabetics to calculate based on a formula, how much insulin they actually needed to manage what they were eating. So here was the principle, it was a very smart principle, given the fact that we didn't really know effectively what our blood sugars were, and we certainly didn't have good insulin. So what they did is they created a table, a calculation with, if you eat this amount of carbohydrate, and we know that insulin clears those carbohydrates, by calculation, here's how much insulin you need to inject before you eat that carbohydrate. And that was the principle of the glycemic index. And you know what? It was the best we had. And it worked pretty well in, 19, in the 1970s and 80s. But it became a carbohydrate consuming, carbohydrate calculating thing based on the premise that we had to eat carbohydrates for our brain, that if we didn't, we would somehow go hypoglycemic and that we could control a certain dose of carbohydrate with a certain dose of insulin. And that has continued to exist continue to exist to this day. We are now 50, 40 to 50 years out from that methodology. And we still use the same principles. Every endocrinologist is trained in the same principles. If I walk past the donut, I'm gonna gain five pounds. So one of the things I've changed apart from being on a ketogenic diet, I like to suppress or reduce caloric consumption. But as you know, you never want to white knuckle your way through a 48 hour fast. So there are times when it's easy and it's straightforward. There are times when I'm really dragging, particularly if I'm not in ketosis where I'm exhausted. That's when I'll use a ketone IQ. Ketone IQ, Cheryl and myself have found is the best formula 
to rapidly promote a ketogenic bloodstream. We have got ketones in my blood work, not a big spike, but a gradual rise that lasts about five hours. But the time I most struggle is in the evening when I'm about to have dinner, but I don't want to have dinner and I'll hit one of these guys. It'll help me to cross to the next day. If I'm in ketosis the next day, I'm good to go. I strongly, strongly support ketone IQ to help you through your fasting. But here's what's changed. Two fundamental things, maybe three fundamental things have changed. Number one, number one, we have much better insulins. There's synthetic insulins. We have ultra rapidly acting insulins that, that function over the course of an hour or two, 10, 10 minute to 45 minute initiation, different for everybody, but rapidly acting. And the commonest ones are Humalog, Fiasp, uh, Novolog. And then we've got the ultra long acting insulins, those that last for a day or longer, um, Levomir, Lantus, uh, Truceba. So we have, and then between that, we have a whole bunch of mixtures of insulins. But the primary ones that we look at are the short acting and the long acting insulins. And we have much, much better quality insulins that we can much more tightly control rapid rises in blood sugar as well as our average blood sugar. That's why I mentioned those two. And then different conversions of, of combined drugs like a 70-30 combinations, um, which are less useful right now. The second thing that has changed dramatically is our incredibly effective ways of measuring blood sugars. Yes, there's still some variability. It's not 100% accurate, but my God, it is so much better. Your finger sticks with a keto mojo or with any Lancet blood sugar testing system, you can get a very, very accurate um, number right away. And if you're comfortable testing multiple times a day, you know exactly what your blood sugars are. The second thing is we now have <clears throat> that. That CGM technology, continuous glucose monitoring. This is the Dexcom G7. And my goodness, is it an accurate piece of equipment. Um, you've got to calibrate. I calibrate. I calibrate. They say you don't have to, but I calibrate, especially the first day or two. But it gives me very detailed information about exactly what my blood sugar is and whether that blood sugar direction is up or down. So not only do I know what my numbers are right away every five minutes, I know what they are every two days, every seven days, every 90 days. I also know whether the trend is up and the trend is down. We've got Libra, we've got um, Eversense, we've got a few others of these CGMs. I was speaking to a patient of mine in China. They've got their own Chinese brands that are not that accurate. But throughout the world, we've got CGM technology. And then we also have the technology with things like Keto Mojo to test, test ketones. So number one, we've got much better quality insulins that much more predictably alter a certain amount of your blood sugar. Secondly, we've got much better monitoring of our real-time blood glucose. And thirdly, we now absolutely categorically know that you do not need carbohydrates in your diet. You have to have carbohydrates in your bloodstream, yes, and at a very tightly controlled level. So your brain needs it, other, other, other cells need it. But you do not need, and it's not your brain, it's the Schwann cells, it's the oligodendrocytes that need it. But um, you do not need to consume carbohydrates because your body is very efficient at making it from protein and glycerol. So once you remove the need to eat carbohydrates, you can then manage fluctuations in your blood sugar by knowing what your blood glucose is and not by treating the carbohydrates you're eating, but now by directly treating your blood sugars. And yet, we've got this beautiful technology, which is uh, pumps, insulin infusion pumps, where you've got a pump that lasts for two, three, four, five days that continuously infuses insulin. Beautiful system, but how have they done it? They've still modeled it on carb, on carb counting, on carbohydrate, which is ridiculous. So in our practice, we've radically changed because we have new technology, we have new concepts, those three things, better insulin, we don't need carbohydrates, <clears throat> and better monitoring to a new form of managing diabetes, where we directly measure and manage average blood glucose at a normal range and spikes in blood sugar to avoid large amplitudes of blood sugar through diet and through insulin. And therefore, our type 1s can get really, really tight control with our protocol. And if you are a type 1, please set up a visit with us because we can help you to convert to that protocol. 
And it makes all the sense in the world because ultimately the complications come from overuse of insulin, hyperinsulinemia, as well as hyperglycemia. So type 1 diabetic has the worst of both worlds, the diabesogenic world, as well as, the, as well as with the hyperinsulinemic obesogenic world. But if you control both and you have the capability of controlling it better than I can is not diabetic, all of those diseases go away and your insulin utilization gets much better. So please set up a visit. As an anecdote, as an anecdote, I've got my friend Fred. Now Fred's been with me for a little while. This guy is just magic. I mean, he is, and I've got a thousand different anecdotes just like this. We'll be publishing a thousand type one patients that we've treated five years out. By the way, that cohort of a thousand patients, I, I've looked at the numbers roughly, we're still crunching them, but it looks like the average A1C for our type 1 diabetics, take guess in your head, if you're a, a 1, if you uh, take guess what the average blood glucose, uh, the average A1C is in that group. Average A1C, and these are patients that are doing very well on this, patients that are not doing so well, average A1C is 5.3. Now it may shift, it may go up or down slightly once we formally crunch the numbers, but average, average A1C is 5.3. And a healthy A1C is 5.2. Think about that. Whereas most endocrinologists want that A1C to be below 7. Think about all the damage that's happening there. So let's talk about my friend Fred. And Fred is just an anecdote. Happened to me in my office. Um, Fred is a 48-year-old gentleman. He's lost a chunk of weight. He's pretty fit. Uh, BMI around 26. Just the nicest guy. Uh, he and his wife, just the nicest couple. Just great people. And the first comes, Fred's been a type 1 diabetic for a very long time. Okay? but has been managing his blood sugar the way we've just described. And the commonest cause of death, commonest cause of death of a type 1 diabetic, stroke heart attack. After potentially they've lost their kidneys, lost limbs, uh, lost digits, um, have neuropathy, have arrhythmias. But the commonest cause of death, heart attack and stroke. And um, hyperglycemia, poorly controlled hyperglycemia, results in plaque in the blood vessels. So... One of the crucial tests we always as a baseline want every type 1 diabetic to have is a coronary artery calcium score. A non-contrast CT scan of the chest as a screen. That should be done as much as they measure their blood glucose and their A1Cs. That is an essential test because it's a common cause of death. And most physicians, most endocrinologists don't even know what the hell it is or how to interpret it, let alone ever order it. Fred had a CAC score done by us. Zero. CAC score of zero. And yet, as a standard of care, his endocrinologist wants him to take a statin. Because every diabetic should be on a statin. Because their cholesterol is so bad. His CAC score is zero. It is malpractice, in my opinion, to put Fred on a statin. Because he doesn't have the disease that these awful drug statins are trying to treat. But a zero. The other benefit of a CAC score, it does look at the rest of the chest, it looks at his lungs, look at the other vessels. So no pulmonary nodules, clean heart, clean lungs, clean blood vessels. So that's Fred's CAC score. Now we look at Fred's, at Fred's um, uh, blood work. And this is just quite amazing. <gasps> oh my God. His cholesterol, his total cholesterol is over 300. 337. And his LDL cholesterol, his bad cholesterol, is 254. Fred's going to die of a heart attack or a stroke in about 10 seconds. How can I possibly say, don't take a statin? Well, the purpose of the statin is to reduce cardiovascular risk. And his cardiovascular risk is zero because we measured it with the zero CAC score. So who the hell cares about his total cholesterol and his LDL? I do, but I want them high. I want those LDLs and those cholesterols to be high. And he is, and it's beautiful. The numbers that most likely correlate with hyperglycemic inflammation of the blood vessels are his triglycerides. And I want his triglycerides to be below 75, and he's at 59. How the hell can a diabetic have triglycerides at 59? Because he follows our eating pattern. He doesn't eat carbohydrates. His HDL is 67. Not quite 75, but about as good as you can get. So his cardiovascular risk is zero, despite that high cholesterol, despite that high LDL. 
And those correlate with healthy longevity, according to the Swedish Longevity Study, published in October. The most important thing about type, two, type 1 diabetes is inflammation. Fred's white count is 3.2. Beautiful and low. I like that to be 5 or lower. That's a marker of vascular inflammation. Hemoglobin is great. His hemoglobin is high at 15. Beautiful. Oxygen carrying capacity is great. Platelet count is good. C-peptide confirms, he's, got no, he's not making any C-peptide, confirms that he's a type 1 diabetic. BUN, creatinine, kidney function, 18 and 85. Absolutely perfect. Spot on. I'd like his creatinine to be 0 0.7, but 0 0.85 is fine. It's a diabetic, no kidney damage. And he's been a long-standing diabetic. Blood sugar, absolutely fine. AST and ALT, livers. No fatty liver here. No markers of a fatty liver. Why not? He should be converting excess sugar to fat. But he's driving it into his cells. Does Fred exercise? Yes. And that's a piece of the equation. He doesn't exercise ri ridiculously, but he he's physically active every day. And now we come to the salient number. Well, his gamma glutamyl transferase also is 10. That means there's no inflammation in the liver. Ferritin is nice and low. So we know his C-peptide is close to zero. His insulin number, ideally, if he's going to be insulin sensitive, I want that below six. He is. He's at 5.9. So normal blood sugar. And his A1C? 5.1. 5.1. And that is because Fred is treating his blood sugar with insulin. He's on Lantus and he's on Humalog. He manages his diabetes with a Dexcom G7. He's physically active and he doesn't eat carbohydrates. And folks, if you have the disease of type 1 diabetes, yes, it sucks. Yes, it's a lifelong disease. But if you manage it like Fred, you are going to be healthier than the average American. You're going to outlive them, outperform them, and be healthier than them. And the technology makes what you're doing so much simpler. You change your CGM every 10 days. You're injecting insulin a couple of times a day. And you're living a wonderful life. And Fred is an example of that. And there's no reason why any of you cannot be that example. So understand where we came from, understand the history, Understand that the majority of endocrinologists, they're not stupid, they're not dumb, they're just trapped in an old way of doing things. They haven't moved into the modern era. It's like, if you drive a gasoline car, get with it, get a Tesla. <laughs> hey, Elon. Um, oh, now that's going to that's gonna generate more comments than the diabetes comments. But the point is, move forward with the times. We've got become better as physicians we have better knowledge, but we still a lot of us are still trapped in old ways of doing things. If you're a type 1 diabetic and you're looking for a consult, please set it up. We can help you, and we can empower you to manage your diabetes better than your own endocrinologist. Because your endocrinologist is actually an enemy of the modern method of managing type 1 diabetes. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you like what we do, we have a charitable organization called NEDS, New Era Diabetes Solutions that is there to educate the public in this new method of, of managing diabetes. Drop us a dollar, drop us a donation. It'll all be used educationally, 